be a little, a little raunchy. raunchy. Yeah. 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 That's part of the fun. Okay. That's yeah. One then. Yeah. 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 All right. Yeah. You can do that. Yeah. 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 Okay. I've had enough of waiting. <laughs> and since I've asked, been asked about the Aurora trip, Aurora Limerick contest, and it's time for this to have started, I will start it. And I will read you the second and the first place of Limericks from the Aurora Limerick contest last Saturday night at the Fargo. We had one person from Wells College submit, and hers came in fourth, so I, and I don't have it with me. But this is the second prize winner from the Limerick Contest. According to my recollections, instead of wailing about lost elections, since the dawning of time, the Limericks rhyme dealt with oversized boobs and erections. <laughs> <laughs> so, Alan, you're advertising for next year's contest, right? Yes, so we await your. And, oh, yes, and I keep saying that for the judges of the Limerick contest, male judges prefer submissions, female judges prefer entries. Oh. oh. Or so I'm told. Anyway, this was the winner uh -oh. called Wake Up Call. A date with Bill Cosby ends bad. Oh, boy. <laughs> with sex that you don't know you've had. He slips you a lewd. You wake up in the nude. Screwed by America's dad. Oh. <laughs> And that was not Bruce Bennett's poem, but he was a model. <laughs> Next. People time now. I get your entries for next year's Limerick contest. I've already got one submission already. All right. Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. Um, you're very welcome. Um, while I'm talking, here's like a, a brief window to go back and, and get more snacks if you, it's snack time and you didn't already load up. What? You did a great <laughs> job. <laughs> um, Rich, go get it. Yes, please do. Um, but also listen to this, because the first thing I have to say is that, um, as always, we want to thank NISCA for their uh, generous support of this program, which allows us to keep bringing excellent writers like Sabrina or Mark to campus. So um, thanks to them. I just filled out the form today that's like, hey, are you doing what you, t said, what you told us you'd be doing? I was like, yes, yes, I really am, I swear. Including thanking you every time I, I get up here to talk. So, gotcha. Um, I'm particularly excited to welcome Sabrina here today because she was supposed to come last semester and the weather gods kept her from us. A hurricane made the drive to the airport in Georgia impossible, so um, she was stuck down at home and um, the plan for tonight is to do a reading followed by a, a we'll have time for a brief Q&A. Um, the getting stuck in the weather thing had a, had a specific material effect, though. This is the broadside that um, Rich Kako, the Book Art Center, uh, designed and produced for in honor of Sabrina's reading for last time. And if you come up and check it out afterwards, you can see that there's a little weather pattern over the original date, and we've got a snow date, and today. So the broadside sort of captures the uh, the weather god's cruelty to us. But this is available as as always for purchase today, half off. It's ten bucks today, and um, it'll be up on the uh, Book Art Center website for purchase online soon enough. That'll be for twenty. So come come grab them while they're hot. 
Uh, similarly, Sabrina has brought um, her two books of poems, her book of stories is forthcoming this year. So, um, and that's what you're gonna be reading from tonight. So, um, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about how if you like these stories, you will, you will love these poems. Um, these are both available um, for $14, special treat today. Um, cash goes to Sabrina, credit cards go to me, same thing with the broadsides, I can, I can do all those transactions. It's the 21st century, happy days. Um, check them out. Woo! Um, yeah. All right, so, um, Sabrina Ora Mark <coughs> is the author of these two poetry collections, The Babies and Simsum. Um, her collection of stories, Wild Milk, is coming out later this year from Dorothy. And her awards include a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, a Sustainable Arts Foundation Award, and the fellowship from the Fine, Work, Fine Arts Work Center in Provincetown, Massachusetts. Um, I've loved her writing from forever, um, for its strangeness, for its genrelessness, the sense that her poems are stories and her stories are poems. I remember hearing a cracked version of a fairy tale at a reading she gave a few years ago and thinking about it for days, about how she managed to be writing about things, but also about writing, about language, about the possibilities and expectations of meaning making with words. Um, she referred recently to a piece she, she had published as a poem story, one word, in Jubilat. And I thought that was, this was on, on Facebook. Right. Like, oh, my poem story is here. And I thought, what a wonderful description for these texts that sort of defy the rigid boundaries of genre that play in the space <coughs> where language is important and opaque and malleable, but stories are the foundation that help us connect to what we're hearing. And I think that space is something that, um, that Sabrina is really like one of the people um, who I think of first when I think of poets who are exploring that space and doing beautiful, surprising, wonderfully weird things in it. And Wells is a place that celebrates the weird, so I thought that <laughs> Sabrina would be an amazing fit. I'm thrilled to have her here reading for us tonight, so please join me in welcoming Sabrina or Mark. Beautiful introduction. Thank you, Dan, and thank you for inviting me out. Um, and thank you to all of you for coming on this cold and sunny evening <laughs> to listen. Um, so thank you, Wells College. Um, so yeah, I'm going to read uh, some poem stories. And they are very much poem stories um, from this uh, new collection that will be out in October. Um, it's funny because I, on the cover of the book, it says Wild Milk Stories, and then I just got my first blurb, which says, these are not stories, so, <laughs> um, which is how you know I'm imaginary. Um, but um, the first, I'm going to read the title story first. It's called Wild Milk, um, and it actually, in, in, um, you guys are good with your snow, but in Georgia, and I'm from New York, I'm from, um, uh, I grew up in Brooklyn, but so um, when I, I, in Georgia, when it snows just a tiny, tiny bit, everything falls madly apart. And um, I guess it was a few years ago where there was um, some, there, we had an ice storm and uh, school buses got stranded on the highway overnight. Um, people couldn't get to their kids, and um, a very good friend of mine had her one-year-old in a daycare and couldn't had to abandon her car, walk home, and could not get to her kid. Which um, and so this story came out of that. This poem, this story, <laughs> um, Wild Milk. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Okay. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Wild milk. On the first day of live oak daycare, 
All the children are given shovels and a small bag of dirt. We encourage the children, even the babies, especially the babies, to work hard imaginatively. Miss Birdie, my son's teacher, winks. She sits my baby boy in the middle of the floor with his shovel and dirt. He is not even a year old. I look around. The babies are happy. I have never seen such happy babies chewing on their shovels, spreading around their dirt. Miss Birdie gives me a hug. I wave goodbye to my boy, but he doesn't see me. Go, go, says Miss Birdie. He's in good hands. She shows me her hands. They remind me, for some reason, of my hands. Three hours later, I come to pick up my boy. He is wearing a bright orange poncho that does not belong to him. He crawls toward me like a searchlight. Your child, says Miss Birdie, is a phenomenon. I blush. Oh, thank you. We too think he is very special, I say. I want to ask about the poncho, but Miss Birdie goes on. I mean, your child is a menomena, says Miss Birdie. What I mean to say is that your child is a real man. Miss Birdie softly pinches her tongue and pulls out a long white hair. Oh, that's better, she says. I mean a ma. She makes little tiny spits. I mean a no one. Your child, says Miss Birdie, is a real no one. No, no, that's not it either. Miss Birdie smooths her stiff cotton skirt. It's pink with tiny red cherries on it. What I mean to say, most of all, says Miss Birdie, is that I love not being dead. Me too, I say. Oh good, says Miss Birdie, here's his bottle. He drank all his milk and then cried and cried and cried for more. In the hallway, I pass a mother covered in daughters. I count approximately five. I hold up my bundled son like a form of identification, like he will provide me safe passage across the border. No daughters, she asks. No, I say, no daughters. How come, she asks. She seems to be blaming me unfairly. By the time they arrived, I explain, the daughters had turned rotten, she asks. Not exactly rotten, but gigantic. I hand her my boy so I can spread my arms wide to show her how big. I take my boy back, gigantic, I repeat, and mealy. I send the whole bin back, the whole bin of daughters back. The brave thing would have been to keep them, I know, but they seem so impossible to name. The mother nods. She still seems to disapprove, but before I can be certain, her daughters lift her up hungrily and carry her away. <laughs> the strange thing about being a mother is how often I'm interrupted. Like something is happening and then something else is happening. It is difficult to get a good grasp on things. The next day, Miss Birdie is peeling vegetables. The babies are watching, transfixed. I have come early to pick up my boy, but I don't see my boy. Miss Birdie points to a child the ch color of chicken broth. Yours, she asks. Definitely not mine, I say. She points to another and another as if I lost my ticket for a coat check. I don't see my boy. It is becoming difficult to breathe and I am suddenly freezing cold. The floor opens up beneath me and just as I begin to fall through, my boy crawls out from underneath a bassinet and his fist is a tiny book. On the cover is a picture of a plain brown mouse. He holds it up. Mouse, he says. This is his first real word. My mouse, he says. I am amazed. I am relieved. His pronunciation is perfect. I want to pick him up, reward him with kisses, hold him and never let him go. But Miss Birdie stops me. No, no, she says. She softly wags a finger at my boy. That's not your mouse. That's no one's mouse. Her voice slows. That mouse, Miss Bertie coughs. That mouse, she says, is alone in this world and barely 
Miss Birdie stops. What was that, she asks. What was what, I say. That sound, says Miss Birdie. I don't know, I say. What did it sound like? It was a sound that sounded like a sound, says Miss Birdie. Like a sound a sound would make. Never mind, where was I? You were with the mouse. Oh, the mouse, do you know him? No, I say, unless you mean, neither do I, says Miss Birdie. And this is my point, that mouse, Miss Birdie is now looking at my boy, that mouse is alone in this world and barely Miss Birdie sucks in one long, beautiful breath. Exists, says Miss Birdie triumphantly. That mouse is not unlike you. She is still looking at my boy. When I call out for that mouse in the dark, does the mouse come? No, the mouse does not. Do you? So far, not even once. My baby puts his whole hand in Miss Birdie's mouth and leaves it there for what seems like days. On Monday, Miss Birdie's bright pink blouse is fluttering with excitement. Your boy wrote his name today all by himself. She hands me a piece of construction paper. Someone, not my baby, has written on it shreds. I hand <laughs> the paper back. That is not his name. Oh, says Miss Birdie. She looks at the paper and her face crumbles. I am sorry, says Miss Birdie. I don't know how this happened. I don't know how anything happens, I say. We hold hands. I'm so lonely, says Miss Birdie. I'm so lonely too, I say. I thought you were in my hiding place, says Miss Birdie. I picture her skull. I thought you were mine, I say. Miss Birdie ties a yellow scarf around her head. Stop picturing my skull, says Miss Birdie. She is clearly upset. Her lips are cracked and begin to bleed a little. She looks at the construction paper and traces each letter with her thumb. If this isn't his name, then whose name is it? She sorts through the other babies. She pats me down as if searching for something. She touches me on the thigh. She feels like she's about to snow. The next day, there's a message from Miss Birdie. We cannot give your boy his bottle. The milk you left was wild. Please bring better milk. I rush to Live Oak. I have no better milk. This is the only milk I have. I point to each breast. Miss Birdie is holding my baby. He is shivering and hungry. Miss Birdie is snowing hard. I try to walk toward her, but there is a great wind, and I can barely see through the big white flakes. This is the only milk I have. I am calling to Miss Birdie and my boy through the snowstorm. My arms are outstretched. Come to mama, I cry. I say my baby's name. It sounds smaller and flatter than I ever imagined. I can't get to him. Miss Birdie is a blizzard that could last all winter. I am sorry, I am shouting. Miss Birdie has my baby and she is snowing. It is all my fault. I should never have left him. I am sorry, I am sorry, I am sorry. I am punching at the snow. I am fighting against nature when I know I have no choice but to wait until spring. The mother, covered in daughters, kneels beside me. This time I count 15. Climb on, she says. I am so sorry, I say. It is the only milk I have. Of course it is, she says. Is there room? I ask around my neck, she says. I climb around it loosely. The mother covered in daughters is warm, and I am so tired. Go to sleep, says the mother. I will wake you up when it's time to go. But the mother never does wake me up which is how you know this story is true. <laughs> okay, let's see, so. Do you guys know the children's book, Are You My Mother? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, I write. I write this to my son.
so many times that as I was reading it, I just started thinking of another story. <laughs> this is my Are You My Mother. Francine Prose, who is my mother, calls to inform me there has been an error, and now she is fairly certain she is not my mother, but someone else's mother. She speaks for a long time, at first nervously, then gradually with great eloquence. After a few hours, she begins to break up. The only thing I can make out is something about Mary's gorgeous hair. I don't know this Mary, although I wish I did. I pick out my nail polish, lucky, lucky lavender. Mom, I say, no, she says. Call me Fran, she says, and hangs up. I call my cleaning lady, Hillary Clinton. She doesn't seem to know who I am, though she cleaned my kitchen no more than three days ago. The stove is still glistening. Are you my mother? I ask. Silence. I ask again. Hillary Clinton? Yes, she says. Are you my mother? More silence. I stare out the window, sunk by Hillary Clinton's remoteness. <laughs> I decide I will clean my own house from now on. After what feels like days, Hillary Clinton asks me what I'm afraid of. Her attention excites me. I answer swiftly, mice, old watering cans, political realities, <laughs> vibrant colors, hooks, Thursday, wounded things, Shep, sacred music. Who's Shep? asks Hillary Clinton. My grandfather, I say. Silence, then a heavier silence. I look around my living room. All my upholstery is frayed. Hillary Clinton? Yes. All my upholstery is frayed. <laughs> Silence. I wish I never called. It's so obvious Hillary Clinton isn't my mother. She doesn't care about me or my upholstery or my deepest fears at all. If she ever came into my room to tuck me in and kiss me goodnight, I would turn my face away. I send a letter to Jory Graham because if Francine Prose is not my mother and Hillary Clinton, my cleaning lady is not my mother, there's a good chance Jory Graham is my mother. The letter is very beautiful and describes what happened with Francine Prose and Hillary Clinton and my upholstery and all my hopes and dreams. Two weeks later, I get a letter back. Jory Graham writes, sounds like a case of overwatering. Same thing <coughs> happens with my plants. Why is everything so goddamn difficult? <laughs> At the very bottom, in very small writing, she writes, How can I be your mother when I am Jory Graham? I am not your mother. Have you tried Diana Ross? <laughs> I have, in fact, tried Diana Ross. <laughs> if Francine Prose is not my mother, and Hillary Clinton is not my mother, and Jory Graham is not my mother, and Diana Ross is not my mother, Maybe John Berryman is my mother. I go to John Berryman's house and knock on his door. He is dead, but he opens anyway. <laughs> he is wearing a salmon-colored sweater. Are you my mother? I ask. I am not your mother, says John Berryman. He opens the door wider. But I could become your mother. <laughs> My grandfather is there. He is wearing an identical salmon-colored sweater. I step inside. It smells like waffles and liver. Touch my sweater, yells <laughs> Chef. I do not want to touch his sweater. Touch it, he roars. I reach my hand out, close my eyes, and touch it. It's incredibly soft. Like God himself, he thunders. Touch John Berryman's sweater. John Berryman blushes and moves very close to me. I quickly touch John Berryman's sweater. It's as soft as Shep's sweater, maybe even softer. You know who gave us these sweaters? Who, I ask. Your mother, says Shep. Francine Prose, I ask. <laughs> Francine Prose is not your mother, says Shep. Then who, I ask. Your mother, yells Shep. I look over at John Berryman. John Berryman, I ask. <laughs> Shep laughs. John Berryman is not your mother. 
but I can become your mother, and I shall marry men. Shep tells me to hold on a minute, disappears into another room, and comes back with a third salmon-colored sweater. <laughs> your mother left this for you, says Shep. Put it on. I put it on. It is beautiful. It is so beautiful, John Berryman begins to cry. I put my arms around him, and we are like one enormous salmon-colored sweater. Don't cry, I say. There, there, I say. What? asks John Berryman. There, there, I say again. He sniffs and looks at me quizzically. It's an expression, I say. It means it'll be okay. But it won't be okay, says John Berryman. It will only get worse. A lot worse, adds Shep. How much, I ask. A ton, says Shep. A ton worse, adds John Berryman. <laughs> Does my mother know? I ask. Of course your mother knows, says Shep. Will she make it better? I ask. She will not make it better, says Shep. Will she at least try? I ask. She will not, says Shep. Can John Berryman make it better? I am <laughs> desperate. He cannot make it better, says Shep. He is only your pretend mother. Why won't my mother make it better, I ask. Shep looks at John Berryman. John Berryman looks at Shep. Is the salmon-colored sweater not enough for you? Asked Shep. He looks more disappointed than angry. It is a very beautiful sweater, soft and warm and probably very expensive. Because if it is not enough, says Shep, give it back. <laughs> I am feeling brave and sad and defiant. I take off the salmon-colored sweater and give it back to Shep. John Berryman begins to cry again. He is not a good mother. <laughs> I put my arms around him. Without the salmon-colored sweater, I feel very small. Also, I am cold. I shiver. I climb under John Berryman's salmon-colored sweater where it is warm. He is sobbing now, heavily. It is like I am in an ocean and the waves are crashing. I close my eyes. <laughs> Did you read that one to your son? No. <laughs> no, they haven't. I haven't. Have I read? Um, I haven't read any of my. They know I write poems um, and stories. Like they um, and and um, my. It, it was funny because originally the title of. Um, uh, my new book was Everything Was Beautiful and Nothing Hurt, which is from the Kurt Slaughterhouse Five. Um, mm -hmm. There's a there's a, um, a gravestone, a picture of a gravestone that says Everything Was Beautiful and Nothing Hurt, um, and we changed the title to Wild Milk. And every time, and so my six year old loves Wild Milk, but every time my four year old hears Wild Milk, he starts to cry and he's like, I wanted it to be the beautiful title. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a, you know, I've already had a bad <laughs> Okay, here's another you guys know um, the song, There's a Hole in the Bucket? Mm -hmm. All right. Should we all sing? <laughs> well, first I wanted to say happy birthday to them, and we were all going to sing happy birthday, but then we could do like one happy birthday, and then one, there's a hole in the bucket. <laughs> or they should replace the happy birthday song with there's a hole in the bucket. That I would like. I think there are some people in this world who love having happy birthday sung to them, and that that there's like half, are you one of the No, Dan is like, one of them. You're no, one no, of them. Totally one of them. I feel like you're one of them. I'm, I'm the person who would marry someone who would volunteer a whole group of people to sing happy birthday. <laughs> 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 Should we all sing happy birthday? Yeah. 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 Okay. One, two, three. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday. Bring it back. Bring it back.
Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's a and then in the meantime, I'm going to try to get the happy birthday song to be changed to There's a Hole in the Bucket. <laughs> <laughs> so this is called There's a Hole in the Bucket. I look at the bucket. There is unquestionably a hole. An entire family could live in this hole. I see the hole, I yell. Call Mendelssohn. My husband, dear Henry, calls Mendelssohn. Mendelssohn comes right over. We look at the bucket. There is a hole. <coughs> Mendelssohn studies it. He takes some notes. The southernmost edge of the hole is silent, possibly frozen. The northernmost rough and forgotten. Mendelssohn sniffs it. Smells like gone, he says, just as I thought. Mendelssohn cups his ear, listens to its center, and jots down a slight trace of heart, the bare cry of a faraway boy. With what shall we, asks dear Henry, fix it? The flower in dear Henry's breast pocket is a pink I've never seen before. Lean close, says Mendelssohn. We lean close. This is going to be a nightmare. Dear Henry and I nod our heads. We know already we will need to fetch the water with a bucket to fix the hole, but we will have no bucket to fetch the water to fix the hole because the bucket with which we would fetch the water has a hole. A white balloon wafts over dear Henry's head. We are failing miserably. With what, asks dear Henry, shall we fix it? He asks again because even though we know how everything ends, the ending remains unimaginable. With straw, says Mendelssohn hopelessly. With straw, I guess, says Mendelssohn again. I look around for straw. Dear Henry opens a can of sardines. He pulls the tin lid and offers me one. No thanks, I say. Looking for straw, I say. He offers a sardine to Mendelssohn. Why not, shrugs Mendelssohn. Sardines are caught mainly at night, says dear Henry. I know, says Mendelssohn, chewing slowly on the fish. They are caught when they rise to the surface to feed on plankton, says dear Henry. This is when they're caught, says dear Henry. They're caught at night when they're the hungriest. I know, says Mendelssohn. Everybody knows. Except, I guess, for the sardines, says dear Henry. <laughs> Mendelssohn laughs. It's not a joke, says dear Henry. Sorry, says Mendelssohn. I'm sorry, too, says dear Henry. <laughs> for what, asks Mendelssohn. Just for everything, says dear Henry. The bucket and the hole and just everything. <laughs> Even though I am certain when I find the straw, the straw will be too long, and I will need to cut the straw with an axe, but the axe will be too dull, and I will need to sharpen the axe with a stone, but the stone will be too dry, and with a hole in the bucket, there is no hope for ever fetching water to wet the stone. I am nevertheless still looking around for straw. <laughs> this is the song we're in. I hate this bucket. I hate this bucket, I yell, more than the hole, asks Dear Henry. He looks so sad. The hole is the hole that the hole should be. It's the bucket that's destroying us, Dear Henry. It's the bucket. I look at Mendelssohn. I mean, I really look at him. Every day he looks more and more like my mother. With what shall we fix it, Mendelssohn? I am exhausted. How many times can a person ask the same question? Mendelssohn kneels gently beside the bucket and reaches all the way in. His dark, soft curls cover his eyes. Liza, says dear Henry, grabbing my arm. I think we're dying. With a stone in his hand, Mendelssohn reaches all the way into the bucket, past. With a stone in his hand, Mendelssohn reaches all the way into the bucket, past the hole, past God and summer and almonds and shame and the ocean and mice and love and fevers and worship and snails and teeth and lilac and forgiveness and a song about a bucket with a hole in it, and past all the children singing the song, and past their children singing it, and their children's children, and past my broken heart, until he re reaches the oldest water and wets the stone. He pulls the stone out and sets it right on top of dear Henry's head, as if dear Henry were a tombstone, and I've come to his grave to mourn him. 
The wet stove glistens so brightly I need to cover my eyes. With what, asks dear Henry, shall we? I can barely hear him. The song is fading like a song. It is what it is. I remove the wet stone from the top of dear Henry's head and bury it, bury it in my pocket. I notice that the crack shaped like a bucket on dear Henry's cheek is spreading. There's a hole in that bucket too. I look over at Mendelssohn. He is building a whole entire city out of buckets. There are holes in all of these, says Mendelssohn, who is now covered in holes under a sky covered in holes, lit by a moon covered in holes, kept by prayers covered in holes. Off in the distance, I can already see the people coming to live in Mendelssohn's city of holes. There are so many people, and they are so beautiful and hopeful, and they too are covered in holes. They each carry a bucket, and in each bucket is a hole. This is the song we're in. There we go. One more. Um, okay, you guys get to choose. So, um, I have one story about a president named Ha, um, and then I have a story about um, a man named Louis C.K. <laughs> uh, the president or Louis C.K.? Oh, God. Louis C.K. We're all done with the president. string up a name and like a light bulb from a wire um, and sort of sway it back and forth across a story. So like I'll have like Hillary Clinton and this story it's Louis C.K. And what I try to do is see how the name changes the wattage, um, uh, uh, how the story changes the wattage of the name and how um, the name will send a kind of um, glare across the story. Um, and what happens, and what I've been, um, and I'm going to talk about this tomorrow um, during the master class, but um, one thing that I found really fascinating is that, like, you take a name, here I wrote this Louis C.K. story before the other Louis C.K. story, and so the story very much changed. Um, and, um, you know, so I kind of like hand a story like over, it, it, I hand the story over to the name in certain ways. Um, and like my goal is that the story kind of holds no matter what happens um, with the, 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 um, the nonfiction version of the person. Um, so. So this is, um, and thank you guys so much for listening. And uh, this is called "Let's Do This Once More," but this time with feeling. <laughs> Louis C.K., my husband, <laughs> piles all my seahorses in the middle of our king-size bed and starts shouting. I see moon and star seahorse and green seahorse and the one with no eyes and pink seahorse and says things seahorse and pregnant seahorse and I see the sad one, but I don't see black seahorse. Where is black seahorse, Louie? This makes Louis C.K., my husband, even angrier. In a fake little girl voice, all sing song, he goes, where is black seahorse, Louie? My husband, Louis C.K., is not being very nice, so I say, no, not Black Seahorse Louis, just Black Seahorse. 
which makes Louie roar. So I say, what's the matter, Louie? Why so boiled? What does your anger, Louie, have to do with my seahorses? <laughs> we go through this every night. In the morning, everything is fine. Louis C.K. and I hold hands. We go to the meadow and make love. We do not bring up the seahorses. Louis pulls my head all the way back. He kisses my throat. His lips are rough like rope. I call out, sweet, sweet nothing. Who, asks Louis? He looks around. Who, he asks, is sweet, sweet nothing? You, I say, though it's impossible to be sure. I cannot explain it, but ever since the seahorses, Louis and I have become less and less human. Our ability to speak has gone from stratospheric to cloudy. Tell me about eternity, Louis, and Louis tells me all about eternity using mostly the wildflowers from the meadow. For hours and hours with the petals and stems, he builds boats and whole entire cities and nations of people with terrible long flowing hair but nothing really comes of it. He speaks for a long time, but the words are few and far between and half finished, like somewhere in the middle of being words, they close their eyes and fell asleep and dreamed they were seahorses. When we get home, Louis C.K., my husband, piles all my seahorses in the middle of our queen-size bed and starts shouting, I thought, Louie, we had a king-size bed. Our bed now is unquestionably queen, which makes the seahorses appear larger than they did the night before. <laughs> Black seahorse is still missing. Louis doesn't answer or look at me. He just keeps piling and shouting and piling and shouting. I see super seahorse and old seahorse and nowhere seahorse and sorry seahorse and the one the other seahorses call the saint and the one they call the fool. We go through this every night. In the morning, everything is fine. Louis C.K. and I go to the diner. We sit in our favorite booth. I love you, says Louis. I love you more, I say. We hold hands. We are very alive. The waitress takes our order. Louis orders two soft-boiled eggs, coffee, and toast with strawberry jam. I order the same. We do not bring up the seahorses. The waitress's name is Poppy. She is wearing a t-shirt with a blue and red rocket ship. Poppy serves us our breakfast. Where is the rocket ship going, asks Louie. Poppy looks at me. I shrug. <laughs> I have no idea. Poppy looks at Louie. She looks down at the rocket ship. Isn't it always going to the moon? asks Poppy. I guess so, says Louie. There is a little bit of jam on Louie's cheek. Poppy dips a napkin into my water glass and wipes it off. <laughs> she kisses Louie on the mouth. He kisses her back. They kiss for a long, long time. Don't be wounded, she whispers. Don't be wounded more, he whispers back. While they kiss, I build a tower out of all the jams and pats of butter and honeys. I collect them from all the booths. The tower is so high, I have to stand on the table to keep building. At the very top, I imagine perching holds me, seahorse, and never let me go, seahorse. But seconds before Louie and Poppy finally stop kissing, the whole tower comes toppling down. Is that all there is? asks Louie. We look around. It seems it is. The diner is empty. Jams and butters and honeys are everywhere. Poppy has disappeared into the kitchen, possibly forever. We look out the window. Out on the street are a few orange and red and green bouncing balls. Neither Louie nor I have ever seen before, but otherwise not much else. <laughs> Our friend Ferguson runs past us. I knock hard on the glass and call out, hey Ferguson, is that all there is? But he doesn't hear me. Go on without us, calls out Louie. But Ferguson has already gone on. Look, says Louie, something fell out of Ferguson's pocket. Louie and I rush out of the empty diner to see what it is. 
Two identical black seahorses lie on their sides. Their heads are touching. I am careful not to get too close. There's something wrong with these seahorses. It is possible their heads are attached. It is possible neither one is my black seahorse. It is possible they are not alive. So is that all there is, asks Louis. He waves his arm, arms around messily. He seems angry. I don't know if by that he means the seahorses or my feelings about the seahorses or my still missing black seahorse or the flash of Ferguson or the broken tower forever ruined or the orange and green uh, the, or the orange and red and green bouncing balls which are still bouncing or life in general or eternity or his undying love for me which might be dying a little on account of the seahorses and on account of kissing Poppy. <laughs> When we get home, Louis C.K., my husband, piles all our seahorses in the middle of our twin bed and starts shouting. I think back to the two identical black seahorses. What, if anything, belongs to me? I mean, really belongs to me. I look up at Louis. Our bed is shrinking. Every day he destroys me, and every day I destroy him in return. Little tiny bits of destroying. It's barely noticeable. We have a baby somewhere, but it is too small. Louis is piling and shouting and piling and shouting. I see bruised seahorse and growling seahorse and rotten seahorse and close-up seahorse and wooden seahorse and happy seahorse and the empty one, but I don't see black seahorse. I call Ferguson. He doesn't answer. I leave a message. We go through this every night. In the morning, everything is fine. Louis, yes, seahorse? <coughs> Louis calls me seahorse. Have we gotten to the sad part yet? Yes, seahorse, we have. When do we get to the funny part, Louis? Soon, says Louis. Soon. Louis C.K. and I go to the misty boneyard. Ferguson is there. He is swaying back and forth like he's praying. In the middle of the boneyard is a water fountain. I take a sip. Louis takes a sip. He looks around. Whose bones are these, seahorse? I look around. Probably ours, I say. Louis puts his hand over his mouth and spits. A tooth falls out, a small one. It is hardly essential to Louis's mouth. Have we gotten to the funny part, Louis? No, seahorse, not yet. He gives me the tooth to hold. I shift it in my palm. It is ice cold. In the space where Louis's tooth once was is a tiny white seahorse flashing bright. We slow dance in the misty boneyard. When Louis isn't looking, I let his tooth fall out of my hand and disappear into a pile of bones. Ferguson is still swaying. He shakes his fists in the air, opens them, and out flies a shower of black seahorses. I count 50, maybe more. I collect them all. I stuff them into my shirt. I am hungry. I want more black seahorses because my black seahorse is still missing. Louis C.K., my husband, and I go back to look for the seahorses that yesterday fell out of Ferguson's pocket. It is a long walk from the misty boneyard to the diner. It takes us two full days, but we get there. The seahorses are exactly where we left them. With the tip of his thumb, Louis flips them over and quickly jumps back. The seahorses crack apart. There's writing on each belly. On one seahorse it says, I do not belong to you. On the other seahorse it says, neither do I. Louis begins to laugh, then I begin to laugh, then Poppy emerges from the sunshine and she begins to laugh too. We are rolling on the ground laughing. I am laughing so hard my chest hurts like I am being shot in the heart over and over and over and over again by bullets in the shape of all the black seahorses that will never belong to me. I want to ask Louis if this is the funny part, but I am laughing so hard I can barely breathe. I want to ask Louis if this is the funny part, but when I catch my breath and look up, Poppy and Louis are gone. 
the only one to ask is a police officer whistling in the distance. In the morning, everything is fine. Actually, um, I had I. This was probably the story in the collection that I wrote the most quickly. I think I um, and I I had this vision of just like this couple yelling about seahorses. I like I just saw, and then it all came together very fast. And then um, like I also wanted to see like what would happen if I turned Ferguson into a man mm -hmm. that, um, you know, moves through the story, like how that would, like, set a kind of, like, political charge through the story. Um, that one came, came quickly. Everything else is, I mean, I have, um, you know, notebooks just, like, filled with just pieces of stories um, all the time that I'm always kind of trying to assemble and um, but I, I usually um, um, and I was talking about this um, in Becca's class like, um, today I, I usually start with a sound like a word or an image like this one was the seahorses um, well the are you, are you my mother started with like you know the space of the are you my mother and the hole in the bucket also like I, I was I was pulling from like structures that were already like very much in place. Um, but I usually start um, with an image or a name and then try to follow it for as long as I possibly can follow it. Uh, and then farther and then farther and then um, have a bit of like a very obsessive I think, personality so I can, I can stick with something for way longer than I should. <laughs> um, so it doesn't work in any other place other than my writing. <laughs> Do these like make any special kind of sense to you, or are they like purposely nonsensical? Like, is there anything at the root of it, or my heart? <laughs> <laughs> For real. I mean, like, I write out of my. I mean, I, you know, I know that's sort of um, a deep oversimplification, but like in many ways, like everything, you know, gets charged through a kind of emotional landscape that I'm trying to articulate, right? So, you know, the are you my mother story, I mean, in many ways, like it's in a, you know, it's it's what happens like as an adult, like it, it's sort of uh, repositioning that story like inside adulthood, right? Like I think we're, there is, you know, even after, you know, you've, you've hatched from the egg, you know, there is, and you've grown up, like there is still like this sense of are you my mother that we like move through the world like I mean I know a lot of writers like you know refer to their like you know mentors as their you know like poet mothers or you know writing mothers or you know um, and so like we have all these like sort of like different mothers and fathers I think like as we um, you know. Um, uh, grow up um, into adults but I would like into forever. Um, and so like I wanted to, that was sort of like at the heart of Are You My Mother? But I, you know, honestly, like I never sit down and say like, okay, I have this goal, and, like this is what I want to do. Like I just, I usually, as I said, like will follow an image and hope that it brings me to some kind of narrative. That if, if it doesn't make a kind of like, logical sense makes a kind of emotional sense um like that's the 
the landscape I follow first is the emotional landscape and then hope that you know I can find a structure to hold hold it up in place. Yeah. Are there any other things that you read kind of like in rotation while writing that also make emotional sense to you in that way? Like do you have like yeah. some writers have things that they're always pouring on and like reading for mm -hmm. comfort, right, while they're writing. Do you yeah. have that? Yes, I have okay. my Bibles. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I have, I'd say like Donald Bartholomew's 60 Stories is like, it's, I mean, the copy I have is like, it's like actually crumbling. I have okay. pages that, um, Lucy Brockbrito's and Master Letters um, has, um, I, I never, I, 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 I sadly never got to meet her um, or even hear her read, but she, um, I always had her book next to me whenever, um, with, with all three books, um, to the point where my, my cat who had passed away, um, I always had to hide all the books because she would like chew on the edges, but the, but Lucy, I had, I had to get like three or four copies of Lucy Brock Broido's books because they were always out and she was always chewing on them. And, um, so all my copies of Lucy Brock, and my cat's name was Lucy, um, not named after Lucy Brock Broido, but, um, um, but her like little, the teeth imprints are all around the edges of her books. Um, but yeah, like there, I have, the, um, some writers refer to that, those books as like your ghost texts, you know, like the, like the books that haunt your, um, the book you're writing. Um, um, I'm like right now totally blanking, but I have like, I mean, piles and piles. Of, but those are like two, two go to books. I mean, I guess going off of that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes in your classes you talk about how like things kind of feel like paintings, right? And the way when you're reading them, like sometimes things feel very surreal. So now mm -hmm. I'm wondering, aren't there any pieces of art that really like make emotional sense to you? Like things that you draw on in that way, mm -hmm. or are you because you're very visual, right? Yeah. Like you like you like to draw on things. Yeah. 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 Y
Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And then um, Maya Darren's films, her short films, also were like a huge influence, especially like on my first book. Um, I also have that the sort of there are these beautiful silent films um, that have that same quality. Yeah. Well, I think we can pause it here. And okay. Thank you, Sabrina. Thank Once you. Time. talk with Sabrina tomorrow. Um, quick reminders about things that are coming up tomorrow. 12.30 is the master class in faculty parlors. Free, open to everybody. Come on by. We're talking about using actual people's names in your work. So, um, How are you going to get in a lot of trouble doing that? <laughs> yeah. I, I, it seems like picking dead people makes it easier. Much but, easier. Uh, <laughs> has Drake, does she have any idea? Awesome. Um, so that's tomorrow at 12.30. Um, tomorrow night, Bob Prohl, the, uh, the fiction writer from down in Ithaca, is coming up to visit um, at 7 o'clock in Zabriskie. Oh, yeah. Um, and then the next Visiting Writers Series event is on Friday, March 30th. It's Shira Dents and Jeffrey Babbitt are coming to read from their new work. Um, you'll get a series of badgering emails from me, so I hope you can come out to that. Um, come on up, check out Sabrina's books are here and the broadside as well. Thank you all so much for coming out and have a wonderful night.